that. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Max Margulies. I'm the Director of Research at the Modern War Institute. And I would like to thank you for joining us for our first War Council of this semester. So these War Councils are designed to connect the West Point community to leading experts who can help explain and contextualize current events as they're happening. Today, we're very fortunate to be joined by a stellar panel for a conversation about the contemporary challenges facing the new Biden administration in the fields of civil military relations and foreign policy. Uh, so we would like to save as much time as possible for audience Q&A. So I will quickly introduce our panelists before turning it over to them for some brief remarks uh, with the quick reminder that this event is recorded and that what you're hearing today are the personal views of our panelists. So first, we are very fortunate to be joined by former Secretary of the Army and sec former Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, who I am pleased to announce is now also a distinguished, the distinguished chair at the Modern War Institute. Uh, so thank you for joining us today for your first MWI appearance. We're also joined by Dr. Risa Brooks, the Alice Chalmers Associate Professor of Political Science at Marquette University and an adjunct scholar at the Modern War Institute. We're joined by Lieutenant Colonel Dan Maurer, a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute, an attorney and an instructor in the law department here at West Point. We're joined by Michael, Major Michael Robinson, an Army strategist and assistant professor of international affairs in West Point Social Sciences Department, and Dr. Heidi Urban, a Modern War Institute adjunct scholar, adjunct associate professor at Georgetown, and recently retired brigade commander. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I will ask audience members to please keep their cameras off and microphones muted just to conserve space for the panelists. And with that, I will turn it over to Secretary Esper for our first remarks. Thank you. Great, well, thank you very much. And thanks for hosting the panel today. Uh, I also want to be brief because I know we want to quickly get to the questions, but uh, let, let me just speak to one issue, and that is civil military relations. I know it's a topic much discussed these days, particularly here in Washington, D.C., but I, I want to begin on a positive note. That is by assuring everybody that we do not have a civilian military control issue in DOD. Um, everybody knows that. The civilians appreciate that. The military at the Pentagon certainly appreciate, appreciates it as well. It's something that goes back to the early days of the Republic. It's, it's ground into the law, into our traditions, our culture, our heritage. And so I have no doubt that, uh, that, that the civilians are in control at the, at the Pentagon in the military and always have been. We do, however, uh, need to improve the civil military relations in the building. Uh, and specifically, that means getting the proper balance between civilians and military when it comes to a number of issues. We can talk about those in detail. This is the particular point that the NDS Commission uh, pointed out in uh, 2018 when they formulated their point, which kicked off this discussion in many ways. Um, the other thing I'd add, though, this is not a DOD-wide issue. This is, again, something that's principally focused on relationships within the Pentagon um, and, 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 and that part, not, not broader within the military, because I know we're speaking to a cadet audience as well. I will tell you, I found this to be the issue. When I became Secretary of the Army in November 2017, uh, I saw the imbalances. So, for example, I thought the combatant commanders, particularly the geographic combatant commanders, were, uh, were uh, exceptionally powerful. I found that the civilian leaders at OSD were not sufficiently engaged. And, uh, and, and my, my study of this at the time and remains is this was not something that happened overnight. It's, it's something that lasted years, in fact, decades. And I would argue that we'd have to go back to Goldwater Nichols to see the beginnings of this. Uh, I will tell you at the time that Secretary Wilson, the Air Force Secretary, Secretary Spencer, and I talked a lot about this and, uh, and, and tried to push a lot of initiatives to restore the balance because we saw the issues actually spilling over into our Title X responsibilities as service secretaries. And I could, I could talk about that, but it had clear, had clear uh, readiness impacts on us. It had budgetary impacts on the services, and uh, it really chipped away at our Title X authorities, and it's something that we work together on. Now, as luck may have it, uh, I, I evolved or moved up from my service secretary position to be defense secretary, and I really had a chance then to take these issues on. And quite honestly, most of the challenges with the civil, civil military balance within the Pentagon can be handled by the Secretary of Defense. And in many cases, it's, it's simple things. So, for example, what I did was I started bringing together all leaders, 
whether they were combatant commanders, uh, civilian leadership, the undersecretaries, and the services at the table at one time, whether it was our weekly command meetings or whether it was our weekly strategy meetings. I wanted to have everybody there. Uh, next, with regard to you know key functions and processes, and for me, uh, that meant uh, uh, updating war plans, which is one of our top 10 objectives when it came to implementing the NDS. I made sure that the, the head of policy was integrated into every one of those uh, key planning points and led the discussion. But not just there, it also involved uh, deployment orders. It involved how we allocated and prioritized resources throughout the DOD. <clears throat> the key thing was getting the civilian leaders involved in all those points because the bottom line, and it's not their fault, the fact is the joint staff and the military within the Pentagon have well-established structures and processes and procedures. Uh, they, they have their own language, their own lexicon. Uh, they don't suffer from leadership gaps or manning gaps. And so that allows them to keep a, a good, steady pace, which is what we want. But if you look today at the Pentagon, I think you only find two out of 61 confirmed positions. And that's a challenge. That's one of the, one of the things that, that it requires uh, DOD with the support of Congress to work on. Some other things that we took, uh, we took responsibility for, which was putting civilians in charge of the fourth estate. Uh, I asked personnel in readiness to really play an active role in training and exercises, which is something they hadn't done in the past. My policy shop, for the first time ever, uh, instituted something called the Guidance for the Development of Alliances and Partnerships. So rather than having six or so different policy approaches through the geographic combatant commanders, we consolidated it at D DOD so that we prioritize countries, that we determine how we would uh, spend our security assistance dollars and do security cooperation. But that said, uh, as much as the Secretary of Defense can do and the Deputy Secretary and others, we still need Congress's help. Uh, I think that uh, every secretary comes in and finds the need to uh, institute reform. Uh, the important thing is for Congress to support the civilians on their reform measures and not allow end arounds by the combatant commanders or by others in uniform. All that does is undermine uh, the civilian, uh, civilian chain of command. Um, and then, as, as I encouraged several members of Congress as I was departing, I think uh, the Congress should go back and take a, a hard look at uh, the laws that have been passed over the many years, beginning with Goldwater Nichols, and, and look at what were the unintended consequences of some of these statutes and how did it affect the civil-military relationship within the building. And I want to be specific on that again. So I'll just wrap up by saying again, we do not have a control issue. We do have relationship problems. Uh, those can be mostly solved by the Secretary of Defense, but he does uh, need the help of Congress, whether it's getting his, uh, his, uh, his civilian deputies and others confirmed, all the way through to supporting his reform efforts and other priorities that he puts forward. you got to work through that civilian chain of command. Thank you. All right, some great comments on civilian oversight and some of the dynamics. Thank you. Uh, Professor Brooks, over to you. Great, thanks so much. And I really appreciated those comments about um, civil military relations as well, and learned a great deal from them. Um, I'm just gonna step back in a couple of minutes and, and take sort of a more bird's eye view um, and pose a couple of questions about sort of US um, policy, US foreign policy and civil military relations. And so I guess I'd start out just by observing that as many cadets who are listening today probably realize that anytime there's a new presidential administration, there's this moment to reflect on what the US role in the world will be um, and what are the major threats and challenges facing the country. And I, and I think what we're seeing is some continuity um, on that on that level, especially with the focus on China, on um, peer competitors, um, and preparation for potential conflict in that domain. Um, but with that, with that continuity and the importance of that, I think it's really important for all of us to sit back and reflect on what the U.S. actually has been doing for the past 20 years on the long wars it has been fighting. And I'm really worried that reflection on those wars is gonna get lost in the shuffle. Um, and part of the reason for that is that, you know, not only the expense in lives, service members, civilians, the billions spent on those wars, but I think the questions looming within the American population about sort of the strategic success of those wars and what sort of benefits, what have we gotten from those wars? Um, 
And you've seen sort of remarkable social mobilization and even opposition to overseas commitments coming out of that. This whole narrative about endless wars really reflects that. Um, so how does, so thinking about that, you know, how does that bear on civil military relations and what's sort of the relationship? I think it, it poses some questions about what role civil military relations might have had in that uncertain strategic success. And you know, what questions does it force us to ask about how well the relationships, as Secretary Esper just emphasized, are working between civilian officials and military leadership? Um, and I'll point to two issues just to, and, and if, if anyone's interested, we can follow up in Q&A. And one is the sort of advisory process or the sort of prevailing conception of what that advisory process should be at the highest level. Um, some of my colleagues have, have written at length about this, but I think we can summarize it as a pretty transactional idea of what advice, military advice to civilians should consist of. This idea that civilians should sort of come together and develop guidance, present it to the military, the military leadership supplies options, and it's sort of this exchange across the divide. And so one question is, how well does that process really serve strategic assessment? The second one um, is broader, and it has to do with the sort of separation of spheres concept and the sort of way that the apolitical um, professional norm is conceived. Um, Nonpartisanship remains central. Cannot emphasize that enough, and we need to work on that and maintain that. But this idea that um, you should throw out the baby with the bathwater and not think about politics at all is really contrary to really good strategic advice and strategic thinking. And so that's another issue that I would sort of wonder if I was trying to figure out and think about what's happened with these wars, think about those kinds of issues in relation to civil military relations. And I hope to encourage uh, all of you who are listening to do that. Thank you. Fantastic. I love that you are asking us to think about this nexus between foreign policy and civil military relations and how they can uh, connect each other. Uh, Colonel Maurer, over to you. Yeah, hi, thanks, and uh, good afternoon. Um, so while Dr. Brooks took a, a bird's eye view of uh, civil military relations, I'm going to take a lawyer's view on civil military relations. And, and in the scholarship and in, in the public conversation, um, a lawyer's view on this topic uh, it's not um, not prolific, I'll just say that. It doesn't tend to be a dominant voice. It's much more of a historian and political science type of field. But when I look at this issue, when I look at the topic of civil relationships, and I'm talking about the relationships at the strategic level, I'm talking about the elites, uh, uh, appointed and elected civilian officials and senior military officials, I look at it as an agency relationship in the same way that a lawyer is an agent to the principal client. The same way a doctor is an agent to a patient uh, who is the principal. So um, I, I view it through that lens. And I would say that uh, my primary background is, is military justice. And what I found is that military justice is kind of like the underappreciated uh, front line in American civil military relationships. You know, it's not exactly the, the forward edge of the battle area, the FIBA, but it's definitely at the front line somewhere uh, in an assembly area. And it's, and it's pretty darn important. And I would say that there are really four actors in that assembly area that we should be talking about. Uh, one is the commander. And there's often a tension between the commander and these other parties pulling in different directions. And that causes a tension in, in the civil relationship. And it's drawn from commanders with what they want to do, uh, vice what they believe uh, or why they believe they want to do it in terms of disciplining their own forces. The other actor in that assembly area is, of course, Congress. As, as former Secretary Esper said, um, Congress has a constitutional role in making rules for the regulation of, of land and naval forces under Article One, um, and in their oversight responsibilities. And that manifests in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh, the third actor in that assembly area is, of course, the Commander in Chief, the President, um, who has a position not just on top of military justice as the commander in chief, but also within the system as a convening authority. And then finally, the fourth actor in this assembly area, if you will, is the courts. And by that, I mean the courts martial and also uh, civilian federal courts, including the Supreme Court. 
um, who are responsible ultimately for guaranteeing kind of the right balance between due process, fairness, justice, and good order and discipline. And so I would just draw draw your attention to kind of three data points uh, from the last four years or so that illustrate why I think there is this tension in this assembly area between the four actors. And the first is, as many cadets are, are well aware, um, Congress's interest in sexual assault and whether or not the military can self-correct in its preventive efforts, in its punishment efforts uh, to eradicate sexual assault. They view the commander, or at least some members of Congress view the commander, not as that central hub around which all of military justice orbits, um, and not even as like a positive enabler of that system, but they view the commander as a potential obstacle in that system. It's important to remember that most of a commander's legal authorities um, come from the UCMJ, which means it comes from a federal statute. It does not come from the president as commander in chief. So in other words, what has been given can be taken away. And the recent Fort Hood report uh, gives Congress many grounds to be skeptical on the role of the commander in this process. So there was talk about taking a commander out of sexual assault investigations entirely uh, and prosecutions entirely. Another COA is taking military commanders out of all felonies, which is um, any crime, essentially any crime that, that uh, has, a, has a max punishment of at least a year. So that's most of the offenses under the UCMJ, including military offenses. So that would be a huge sea change in how we do discipline. Um, another one would be just leaving commanders in charge of kind of the military offenses like disobedience and AWOL and uh, misconduct before the enemy and conduct of becoming. But the president has the power right now to establish what those maximum punishments are. But the president can only do that because Congress grants him that authority in the UCMJ. So you can see there's a entanglement with all these actors that kind of lie behind the scenes that you don't normally see when you're talking about course martial. The second big issue uh, was President Trump's pardoning of uh, four individuals um, for conduct that arguably could have been prosecuted as a war crime. And President Trump is the first president, first commander in chief in history to do that. Um, many presidents have pardoned soldiers. Not even Nixon pardoned Cali for his uh, his actions in My Lai. Uh, he granted the clemency by taking him out of prison and putting him in, in house arrest uh, for three years before he was released on parole, but he wasn't pardoned. So when a president does this, when a president pardons war criminals, it raises some issues. It raises issues of um, is the administration as a matter of policy um, uh, supporting the rule of law? Are we engaging with our international law obligations to fully investigate and prosecute and punish war criminals? We have that duty under international law. So when a president pardons someone for that kind of war crime, we're kind of thumbing our nose at, at that establishment, at that rule of law. So that's a concern. And then the other big concern from a civil mill dynamic is, at least in, in these instances, to my knowledge, the senior military leadership advocated pretty strongly against granting those pardons. So when a civilian leader uh, like the president um, ignores the advice or takes the advice and, and, and goes against the advice of, of the expert professionals, um, it raises questions about why. Why is the president doing that? Why is the senior civilian doing that? Um, but of course, we have to keep in mind that this is, as, as Elliot Cohen talks about, an unequal dialogue, right? There should be a dialogue. And if there isn't a dialogue, that's definitely a, a cause for concern. But the, ultimately, one party has the veto on this. So as long as the conversation is mutually respectful, that is, of the opinions, of the facts, and of the advice, ultimately, you know, the civilian is going to come out on top even if they're wrong. And as Peter Fever says, the civilian has a right to be wrong. So there's that dynamic too. What, what happens when a president gets involved, intervenes in military justice? What signals does that send about the president's confidence in our internal code of discipline? So I guess I would wrap up with saying the big question that all this indicates is this. If Congress takes commanders out of military justice, or if presidents start intervening in military justice, in ways that are kind of unconventional and ahistorical, um, does that necessarily or even foreseeably degrade our combat readiness or our combat effectiveness? And I'll, I'll tell you the answer that is given is that it's yes, that it would degrade. That's the most common answer. But that's not based on any empirical data. It's not based on any proof of concept. It's not based on any pilot study. 
And so we make these arguments without anything other than kind of anecdotal claims and, and history and speculations about what might happen uh, to the system if commanders are somehow pulled out of it. So we have to ask ourselves this question. Is the military failing in its duty to provide honest, candid, and complete counsel as the agent in the civil war relationship? That's what we should be asking. And that's why I view military justice as this, this underappreciated front line in the overall, uh, the overall subject matter. Thanks. All right, thank you. I think um, a, your principal agent framework and a call for more evidence-based research to evaluate some of our assumptions will be appreciated by all the members of this panel. Major Robinson. Great, thank you very much. And I wanna thank Dr. Margulies and the uh, Modern War Institute for putting on such a great event. Uh, I wanna briefly discuss uh, something that's the substance of which I'm, I'm working in a piece right now between myself and, uh, and Corey Shockey at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, briefly, just about some of the challenges on the civil military relations front that have to do with another leg of the relationship from what Secretary Esper, Secretary Esper was, was mentioning, which is uh, with respect to mil civil military affairs and the relationship between the public and the armed forces. Uh, especially in light of the recent January 6th attack on the Capitol and the high profile presence of military and veterans there. Now, these events have forced a sort of reckoning, uh, not only with a new administration that is trying to shore up America's small d democratic bona fides overseas, but with defense leaders who are charged with, with mending the state of civil military relations. Uh, and now, Secretary Austin has taken some responsive action by making combating right wing extremism in the military a priority. Uh, and these efforts should be lauded. I also worry that, that too much of the surrounding proposals have focused on some parts of this problem at the expense of others. And I think there are three areas in particular that, that meet this standard. The first is that the, the secondary reporting about this incident drew a lot of attention to the biographical data of the people involved, particularly characterizing a disproportionate amount of veterans and even active duty service members who were among those who were engaging in violent and seditious behavior at the Capitol. Now, while data on extremism in the ranks has been notoriously difficult to capture, the information we do have on extremist groups themselves reveals that once we account for the fact that this was not a random sample, uh, the veteran proportion of these groups was actually pretty much in line with the historical average. About one quarter of right-wing extremists are classified as having military experience. About a fifth of adult males in the U.S. are veterans of some type. So rather than examining the statistical proportion, we should be normatively outraged that any proportion of veterans are filling the ranks of violent extremist organizations like the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Free Percenters, to name a few, who intentionally recruit ex-military figures. Uh, this leads to the second area that I think just misses the mark, and that's that analysts have expressed concern at the presence of military veterans in these groups because of the tactical knowledge and expertise that they might provide. And this will make those groups even more dangerous than they already are. This is certainly a powerful concern and should be cut off from the DOD side however possible. Unfortunately, I think less attention has been paid to a more subtle uh, but potentially more harmful commodity that veterans are recruited for, which is political legitimacy. And so white supremacist and anti-government groups bring ex-military figures into their ranks to cash in on a positive affect that many Americans had for the military. And we observe this in the way they actively blur the lines between the military and themselves. They co-opt military iconography, symbols, even apparel and equipment in an effort to lend radical extremist groups mainstream credibility. So the last comment I wanna make is how these first two points have really only been discussed so far, insofar as they have military solutions to them. I think there's been undue focus about how DOD is going to fix the problem in its totality. It should be noted they certainly own the challenge of combating extremism in the active force, and this is absolutely part of the solution set. But existing data on extremism has shown that most veterans who join extremist groups don't radicalize until after their service is complete. And so the result is that the military may have less of a role in solving the larger problem than we think. Senior uniformed leaders have to attack with energy into the moment to prevent the growth of right-wing extremism in the ranks. But once those figures cross in, into private life, post-service actors joining extremist groups are the purview of the public. Civilian law enforcement should investigate them, civilian courts should try them, and yes, civilians should accept the fact that they do not represent the military but society generally. And the public's sort of distant and overly deferential love affair with the military has often prevented a clear-eyed assessment of that institution's credentials, and I think healthy civil military relations requires just such clarity. So thank you, I look forward to everyone's questions. All right, we can always count on a veteran SS-307 course director to 
bring us in with plenty of evidence to support his argument in response to Colonel Maurer's call. All right, Professor Urban, can you take us home? Absolutely. Thanks, Max. And thanks again to uh, MWI for sponsoring today's panel. I, I really want to direct my comments to the cadets who are uh, attending here today. And I would offer that the top civil military relations challenges facing the Army today are internal factors. Debates on the Army's role in multi-domain operations are hugely important. But before we can think about that, we have to get our house in order. And the Army's readiness will continue to be degraded if it cannot sufficiently address three critical challenges. Coincidentally, our inability to address these issues also threatens to erode the American public's trust and confidence in its Army. First is the inability to curb sexual harassment and sexual assault and to establish a culture that is totally intolerant of the continuum of behavior and language that leads to sexual harassment and sexual assault. I trust each and every one of you have read the Fort Hood Independent Review Report by now, but it would be a mistake to conclude this is a problem unique to Fort Hood or to a particular unit. And unfortunately, I can assure you, this is a problem you will face in your platoon and your company, a problem that needs your leadership, your attention, and your personal involvement. Second is systemic racism. A 2017 DOD report found that a third of African-American service members indicated they had experienced racial discrimination or har harassment during a 12-month period. Similarly, a 2020 Reuters study found that uniformed members of the military rarely file former, formal equal opportunity complaints for racial discrimination, suggesting they don't trust the system. So don't assume that because our army is more diverse than it's ever been, that we don't have real issues of discrimination within our ranks. Third is the issue of domestic extremism and white nationalism resident within our ranks. The insurrection against the Capitol on January 6th should serve as a wake-up call on many fronts. And as Major Robinson highlighted, we should draw a stark line between veterans and those serving on active duty and disavow entirely veterans who participate in violent extremist organizations. But don't for a second think that this isn't something the active duty force has to contend with. We should also think long and hard about the portion of active duty service members who have fallen prey to disinformation, online especially, and what your particular responsibilities are as members of the profession of arms. And lastly, while I know West Point does a tremendous job of encouraging cadets to reflect on deeply on the oath to the Constitution that many of you will take very soon, but don't assume your soldiers have reflected on it. And if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, Brigadier General Retired Paula Thornhill's article in Defense One just a few days ago that provides a blueprint on how officers might teach those in their formations about the oath and what specifically you swear to protect and defend. It's not just a faded piece of parchment. We measure readiness in terms of equipment readiness, our performance at combat training centers, the frequency with which we conduct combined arms, live fire events, and so on. And soon you'll get intimately acquainted with the metrics the Army uses to track each of these things. But what I'd offer is the most important aspects of readiness pertain to the human capital in our Army. And your most important pacing item is the soldier. There are many more readiness challenges you'll encounter as an officer. I chose these three because they might not be the top three you think of when you think of readiness or civil military relations challenges. The sooner you do, I argue, uh, the more prepared you'll be in your formations and the more prepared you'll be to, to build a culture of trust and cohesion. So Max, thanks very much and back over to you. All right, thank you everyone. Great comments all around uh, and we still have 
I believe my math is correct, which it rarely is, around 25 minutes for Q&A. I will take the moderator's privilege of asking the first question. Um, and while our panelists are responding, um, I will just remind everyone to please use the raise hand feature to indicate if you have a question. Or if you must, you can always type it out in the chat as well. And I'll do my best to call on everyone in a fair and equitable manner. So I think for the first question, something that everybody touched on to some extent is this idea of the role of best military advice or military expertise. Um, and President Biden has been in office for around a month now. And of course, he's no stranger to the national political scene anyway. So I was wondering if what do we know? I'd love to hear from the panel. What do we know so far about how President Biden approaches military advice when it comes to thinking about the American role in the world? Um, I'm thinking especially with some of the big challenges, foreign policy challenges facing the United States today, like negotiations in Afghanistan and the rise of China. Who would like to take a first stab at it? I'm not sure we know all that much yet, Max, <laughs> but um, I would suspect, I, I think there are two things that might provide some guides. One is, you know, if I was just teaching to my American national security policy class how presidential pol personality affects how they manage any advisory process, and it seems as though President Biden puts a premium on relationships and sort of interpersonal connections. And I would imagine that that will shape how he engages with the chairman, with other military leadership as well, and that that will be an important sort of data point. I guess I would also add that um, Secretary Austin has been a pretty visible um, personality so far. And I think it looks as though um, uh, President Biden is going to put a lot of support in that role and that that's a really important healthy indicator that you should always be supporting your Secretary of Defense in that manner. Thank you. Max, I think I'll take the next one, um, if I may. So sure. I, I agree with, with uh, Dr. Brooks, I, I don't think we know quite quite as much as we want to right now. It's still pretty early on, but um, she, she mentioned that, uh, that President Biden has a, a premium on interpersonal relationships, and I, I think that's true, but I also think President Trump did too, in his own fashion. Um, whereas President Biden seems to have uh, strong relationships based on past experience and, and which builds trust, um, President Trump seemed to, at least in, in the public record, seemed to base his personal relationships on uh, a kind of a transactional model and based on loyalty. And so loyalty is a, is a big concern. And this, I think, brings, brings us back into talking about the oath and what exactly are we loyal to? And this is something that, that I talk about uh, in, in our con law class because we, we teach constitutional law be, since 1820 something um, because our cadets are going to take an oath to that, that constitution. So they should understand something about what the constitution is and what it is you're, you're pledging fidelity to. And it's not pledging fidelity to the president or the office of the president. It's pledging fidelity to the constitution and what it means, which is hard to do because it's hard to understand. And it's, it's never going to give you a concrete black and white answer, very rarely. So kind of the default setting is, is a, a, a loyalty to the orders above you. And when those orders seem to be legitimate, um, at least they follow some kind of legitimate process, it's very difficult to um, not follow them. Uh, you presume that they're in fact lawful and constitutional. And I would just say that there's a, a distinction between the, the officer oath, as we all know, and, and the enlisted oath. The primary distinction is this. The enlisted oath includes a pledge to, and I quote, um, obey the orders of the president of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to regulations and UCMJ. That line is not in the officer oath. And that's, that, that, those oaths have been in place like that for quite some time. So this 
raises the, the recurring issue of, of loyalty and who are our troops loyal to, why are they loyal to them, and what as leaders do we expect them to be loyal to? As a, as a brand new platoon leader, do you expect your soldiers to be loyal to you or loyal to the mission, loyal to the unit, loyal to their peers, loyal to something even bigger than all of that? You know, down in the, down in the dirt or the sand or the mud or whatever you, you want to call it, um, it's very easy to fall into the trap of this is my band of brothers and sisters and uh, they are my family and I am loyal to them. Well, when you extend that logic out and up the chain of command, um, it, it it becomes problematic because now you don't owe a personal debt and loyalty to a person. You owe it to an idea. And that idea is sometimes under attack. So that's what I would I would I would I would leave us with. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. I, I realized that I was asking for a little bit of speculation there. So I appreciate that you both managed to still give uh, informed answers that are based in research. Um, if nobody else wants to take a stab, I see Dr. Jackie Kem has his hand up. Thank you, Max. I'm uh, Dr. Jackie Kem. I'm an adjunct uh, scholar also at MWI and at the Army's Command and General Staff College as Associate Dean. Max mentioned the term best military advice. So my question, which is uh, primarily focused uh, to Secretary Esper, but others, as they may add, is in terms of civil military relations and foreign policy. Should military leadership restrict their recommendations to purely military advice, or is there an obligation to expand beyond just military considerations at times? Thank you. Uh, so I, I think it depends on the situation. Uh, you, you know, I've often uh, obviously had military advice from, from all of my combatant commanders and even the service chiefs, uh, in addition to the civilian leaders, of course. But uh, I certainly would welcome views broader than that. I think it's important to have that broader understanding of what may be happening in a region politically, uh, politically with regard to a foreign government or what's happening between ethnic groups or tribal groups or stuff like that. So it, 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 all this comes down to the, 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 the style and personality and, and leadership uh, techniques of the principal, and I would welcome it. Uh, now, of course, there are some times where uh, only the only proper thing is purely military advice. And, uh, and and I think we stick with that. I somebody mentioned this early in our conversation about apolitical, and maybe there are different ter interpretations. You know, being apolitical, which is something I certainly spoke about during my tenure and said that that was the, the approach I took and DoD took, doesn't mean that you don't understand politics. Uh, doesn't mean that you don't factor politics into your plans and strategies and how you engage. What it means and and, and you guys are the you know the experts in academia. In my my view, it means you don't play politics. Uh, you, you don't you don't use the military as a political tool. Those are the distinctions I would make in my in my head. I mean, look, I spent 25 years in D.C. I was on a presidential campaign. I worked in the House and the Senate, so I understand politics, and it's what I thought made me effective, both in the building and outside the building. But that's different than playing politics with the building or with DOD. And I, that's an important distinction. So it's important for uniform leaders to understand that as well, to understand the political role, but don't try to play politics within it or speculate that. Because I think it's it's one thing for a civilian political appointee. By definition, I am political. I have one foot uh, trying to stay out of politics and the other foot in it. But for the military, it's very clear. It's black and white. Uh, you stay out of politics. You've got that uniform on. Uh, you know, and, and that's the line you got to draw. And these are these are important nuances. Now, uh, look for the cadets. Not much. This is not something you need to worry about now. You need to focus on being great platoon leaders. And I think what uh, what Dr. Urban said about uh, you know sexual harassment, extremism. I would just double down on that because I think it's great advice. Make your corner of the army the best it can be, and show the right example to your platoons, to your fellow platoon leaders, even to your company commanders what it's right to lead morally, ethically, and by doing the right thing. Any res responses? Anybody else want to add? I guess I would just say that I really appreciate that clarification of what apolitical does and does not mean. And I think that sometimes that's, that nuance isn't communicated or understood 
And hearing it from someone such as you, Secretary Esper, I think really is helpful in, in preparing cadets, even though they're not gonna be thinking about this in the near term, eventually, potentially, to really think about what that means and what their roles and responsibilities encompass and do not include. Great, thank you. Okay, glad to see some cadets raising their hands. Um, Ryan Johnson, why don't you go? Hello, uh, my name is Ryan Johnson. I'm a first year at West Point American politics major. Uh, my question relates to the SIFMIL gap uh, and specifically how the Army is becoming more technical and the implications with having to recruit civilians um, with increased technical expertise and what that means for the institutional and organizational models proposed by Moscow's and how through these incentives and recruitings are we possibly eroding the institutional norms uh, that the military has adopted in that professionalism. Thank you. So if I could rephrase your question, I think it's something that's that I'm personally very interested in. You're you're asking about how um, whether a need to kind of retarget or change recruitment policies to attract more or different types of civilian talent, how does that affect civil military relations? Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. Great question. Max, I'm sorry, is the question attracting civilians into the uniform military or I, I, I still don't understand the question. I think that's the question. I guess ideas about changing policies for more direct commissioning at higher ranks or um, policies about changing standards, either physical or, or discipline or uniform to attract people that might not otherwise be amenable to the military lifestyle, but who have skills that the uniformed members of the military would benefit from. Well, I'll, I'll take first stab at it because, uh, it, it, so, uh, you know, when I was Secretary of the Army, uh, we were facing some recruiting challenges. And I, I will tell you that, uh, as I recall the numbers, I think only, only less than a third of America's youth are qualified to serve for one reason or another. And of that, those who have propensity to serve is like 2% or 3%. So our view, and we, we launched this initiative called the 21 City Initiative, is that we need to get out and actively recruit more Americans from a broader cross-section of the country, from all four corners, from you know rural America to urban America and everything in between. We have to actively recruit uh, young men and women from across the country. We need to represent the American people that we are sworn to defend, and, and if we don't, it gets dangerous. We become, uh, you know, we become a more and more isolated. And, and I would argue that we've seen some of that over, at least during my time from a, being a cadet to today. Uh, so I think we do need to recruit, recruit broadly. And uh, the second thing I'd add is, yes, there are certain skills out there that we simply can't train, or we can't pay for, or we can't recruit, and um, and we should. We should be innovative in terms of doing that, uh, whether it's cyber skills um, uh, is an example. Uh, we've done this in the past with special forces, and it's not ahistorical. If you go back and look at World War II, we direct commissioned general officers into the military to help with the war effort. So I, now I think you make a fair point. How do you make sure that that um, uh, that that those people that you bring in share those same uh, values? Um, they, they, they understand the profession, et cetera. Uh, I would argue that there's people in the military who have been given those classes and still don't get it. Uh, so, but, but that doesn't mean you, you shouldn't. You have to continue to promote those values and those types of things. But I do think we need to be able to think outside the box to attract the best and brightest that America can have to offer and make sure that those best and brightest are as from as many diverse communities as possible so that we are as ready and capable as we need to be to defend the country. Max? Yeah, and yeah, go for it. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree uh, with Secretary Esper. Um, I, th I think we should not be afraid of change, right? I don't think we should be concerned necessarily about eroding of norms. One, we're not all clear on what those norms are. We're not all clear on whether we agree about whether those norms are worth keeping, first of all. Um, so I, I would draw this analogy, right? Um, most JAGs have practiced law before they came in the military. Most JAGs 
are direct commissioned into the military, just like most doctors are direct commissioned into the military. So in the in the decades since the UCMJ, when we now have by statute uh, lawyers in the courtroom, which we did not necessarily have before the UCMJ, uh, lawyers who are trained and educated in civilian law schools, who are licensed to practice law by civilian authorities. What has that brought to the Army? Now, I'm a, a bit biased here, or the Navy or the Air Force or the Space Force. Uh, I'm a bit biased, I, I admit that. But in the period since then, um, our system has become more civilianized, quote unquote. So let me, let me uh, quote real quick what General William Tecumseh Sherman said in the late 1880s. Now, Sherman was, as you know, a famous Civil War general for the North, and he was also a lawyer. And he wrote a treatise on military law uh, after, after he left the service. And he said, it will be grave error if by negligence we permit the military law to become emasculated by allowing lawyers to eject into it principles derived from their practice in the civil courts, which belong to a totally different system of jurisprudence. The object of military law is to govern armies composed of strong men so as to be capable of exercising the largest measure of force at the will of the nation. These objects are as wide apart as the poles. Now, none of us agree with that now, but that was the prevailing opinion at the time. Don't bring in civilian lawyers because it brings in civilian concepts of due process and fairness and justice, which might run contrary to the prevailing norms about why commanders are important to good order and discipline. Yet here we are uh, more than a century later, and dare I say, we have a better system than we did before. So norms change, norms erode. Norms get rebuilt and refashioned. And just because we haven't done it before in the past doesn't mean we shouldn't do it in the future. That's what I would say. Great, thank you so much. Uh, fantastic perspectives there. Uh, Cadet Jonathan Dow. Yes, sir. So um, my name is Jonathan Dow. I'm a first year also American politics major here. Uh, so my question is more foreign policy based. Uh, but President Biden has kind of pushed this, quote, America is back, unquote, uh, in some remarks to the Munich Security Conference uh, last week, I believe it was. Um, and the reception, I guess, from uh, Chancellor Merkel and President Macron and others wasn't as, I guess, warm as, as we would expect. Um, they kind of cited the, you know, sometimes fraying relationships uh, with the U.S. over the last uh, number of years. Uh, and particularly in light of you know, China's efforts to increase trade relationships with the European Union, um, Russia, and their, um, I guess, deal with, with Germany over the North Street pipeline and other things. Uh, how does, you know, that fraying of relationships, I guess, or straining there of uh, relationships with the U.S. and Europe affect our ability to confront other geopolitical adversaries like Russia and China, um, and also to the, the military or the civil military relations side? Like, is there a role for military leaders uh, to play in shaping our um, approach to that to that problem. Thank you. No one wants to chime in. I can give it a stab. Um, one of the things I think is so interesting is how much continuity there has been in the relationships between military, U.S. military leadership and their counterparts in Europe. So despite the fact that we see um, some disruption or, or turmoil in the relationship between allies and the US and the White House um, in these past several years, those relationships, at least from what I can tell, uh, look on the military to military side have been really secure. And that military leadership has been affirming of the need to maintain alliances and of the importance of those relationships. And so has played sort of a stabilizing role um, in that. I'll, I'll jump into and now off to start for a quick perspective. I think, uh, I think uh, Dr. Brooks was alluding to this, said this, that the most enduring um, relationships we have are at the mill to mill level. And uh, if you look in the past, when you've seen ups and downs at the civilian level, at the political level, it's been the mill to mill level that has endured, whether it was, you know, the relationship fraying under the Obama administration with the Egyptians, uh, for example, the, the, the mill to mill contacts that we held really endure. Even today, uh, relationships are fraught between the United States and Turkey, 
but the mill to mill relationships have held, partly because of programs such as IMET, uh, the fact we, we bring them to our schools and, uh, and, and vice versa. Those are all very important things. But look, tension in NATO is not new. There's been turmoil in NATO since its beginning. And uh, you can look through any administration, it doesn't matter whether it's Republican or Democrat, you will see uh, turbulence between the United States and its allies or between other allies within, uh, within, the, within NATO. And NATO, by the way, is the, you know, arguably the greatest uh, alliance of, 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 in time that, that I can think of and has held up fairly well. But there will be, there's, there's, there are always squabbles between allies. I mean, look, a year ago, we had Turkey uh, squabbling with, uh, with France and the Med. We had Turkey uh, uh, facing off against Greece uh, over, uh, over the waters between them. You had Turkey and the United States. We have Turkey holding up war plans in the Balkans. I mean, I, I could take you around in the course of a year and tell you all the different conflicts, not just between Turkey, but between any number of NATO countries. So it's not a new thing, but at the end of the day, everybody recognizes that NATO is important and we need it. And we do have a lot of shared values and it will endure. And, and, and President Biden has been around long enough. I think, I, I think one of the first Munich conferences I went to as a congressional staffer was with him. Uh, so he knows this terrain fairly well, and he's going to face his fair share of challenges uh, uh, during his tenure, for sure, and and, uh, and and that will be normal. All right. Thank you. I'm going to do something very risky now, since we only have roughly three minutes left, but I'm going to ask each of the three people who have their hands up to quickly share their questions, and then we'll try to cram in answers as best we can. So, uh, Paul, why don't you go first, and then Charles, and then Leah? Hi, Max. Um, greetings from the UK. Um, I'm a, a fellow at MWI. Um, just a, a point of reassurance, first of all, that we have the same sort of issues with sexual harassment, racism, etc. that you have. Um, and one of the questions I'd like to ask there is, is that because we don't engage with those problems? We tend to impose top-down solutions. Um, that's a quick uh, fire. Great. Charles? Hi, uh, thank you. If this civilianization of the military justice system continues and Congress does pull commander's ability to prosecute sexual harassment and assault, how could this potentially affect young leaders' ability to establish and maintain that intolerable culture if we no longer play a direct role in the prosecution? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so real quick, uh, I think to answer Paul's question in a superficial way, and I apologize in advance, um, I think for most of our history, commanders have viewed such challenges and top-down solutions uh, imposed as one more training requirement to get through um, and not emphasize it as much as kind of the, what the traditional model of leadership is all about, which is, well, at least in the military, accomplishing the mission, which, which has been narrowly uh, defined, I guess you could say, as you know, preparing and winning wars. Um, so I think, I think that paradigm, for lack of a better phrase, is shifting. Uh, to answer uh, Chuck's question, I appreciate the, the civil and justice tie-in. Um, uh, I don't think, let's say commanders get pulled out um, and are no longer able to make command decisions about disciplining for, say, major felonies. That does not mean commanders don't have a role. One, commanders uh, mentor and model best practices and best behavior. That's, that's actually in the statute um, required of leaders and officers. So modeling the right behavior is one role that you play. Two, you, you still advise. You're still going to have a role, assuming this would happen. Uh, you would still have a major role in advising um, the prosecution in, in kind of the same way, analogous way that, that, that JAGs now advise commanders. It would just be flipped. You would still have a major role in helping shape uh, what the prosecution aims for and what the end result that would be solved. So I don't think, I don't think removing the, the legal authority removes your ability to influence at all. Hey Max, if I could jump in to just to um, add a few comments uh, back to Paul's question too. I, I do agree that some of this comes down to a top down, a preference for top down solutions. The other thing that I would offer why this our inability to tackle sexual harassment and assault, especially, has been so so uh, problematic. It's not a new issue, right? And, and and yes, 
all of our allies contend with the same challenge. But I think there are two pitfalls we make um, in the Army and across the military. One is we think uh, we can delegate this to certain key enablers of, well, I have victim advocates that handle this. I have sexual assault response coordinators do this. What's missing is ownership at every level of command. The second thing that I hear routinely, and kind of Dan hit at this, um, and, and I heard this from peers and subordinates after the Fort Hood report, there's this false binary view of, well, you know, I'm really, really busy and op tempo is super high, and that's a reason why we just couldn't address this more fully. And, and I find that absurd, right? It's the idea that, uh, well, I can go to NTC and do really well, or I can prevent sexual assault in my formation, but clearly I can't do both. At, at no point is that level of compartmentalization or this binary view acceptable in any other aspect of officership. I think until we kind of address both, both of those, those aspects of ownership, we're going to have trouble with this. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So I want to thank all of our panelists for their fantastic insights. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, if anybody else has any remaining questions, uh, and I know Leo is having some technical difficulties, I can try to connect you to the, to the panelists to continue the conversation. So please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and check out, uh, make sure you keep an eye on our website for the recording, which should be available in the next week or so. And join us in exactly one month for our next War Council, co-hosted with the West Point's Lieber Institute on the future of proxy warfare. So thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. From all of the folks here at the Modern War Institute, we would like to thank you for watching our videos and invite you to explore our podcasts and our webpage linked below.